You're listening to the Sermon Podcast for the Peak Church, located in Apex, North Carolina. Our church is striving to welcome all who are feeling disconnected from God. And so our hope is that over the next several minutes, you will connect with the God that we are talking about, and you'll resonate deeply with the life that this God wants for you. We hope you enjoy. Our scripture passage for today is from the book of John, chapter 15, verses 9 through 13. As the Father loved me, I too have loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. This is my commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. No one has greater love than to give up one's life for one's friends. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Peak Church. Uh, My name is Katie Miller. Like Julie said, you might recognize me from like six feet farther back than this. Um, When Pastor Kyle invited me to preach this week, I was uninvited from being on the worship team today. Um, To be fair, that would have been a lot uh, for me and a lot of me for you, so it's okay. (laughs) But I feel weird being here without doing any kind of music at all, so if it's okay, we are going to start this morning with a quick game called Name That Song. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask Randall to show you a few pictures of sort of iconic Disney duos who also have what I think of as an iconic song that is their song. And I would like you all to name or sing, if you are feeling awake enough, um, that song. Okay. Good? All right. We have Buzz and Woody. You've got a friend in me. Thank you, Bob. That is also the name of the song, yes. (laughs) All right, uh, next up, a little bit of a deep track. We have Cooper and Todd. Oh, you like almost know it. (laughs) This is When You're the Best of Friends. Uh, Those of you who recognize this are like a little sad now, and I'm really sorry. (laughs) Um, Another throwback that's less sad, Robin Hood and Little John. Yes, I hear someone singing it. This is kind of a trick question. The name of this song is Oodalali. Um, I didn't expect you to know that, but one of the best, I think, sleeper songs in the Disney canon, reminiscing this and that and having such a good time, that's like good lyricism. Okay. All right, last one. This could technically have a few different answers, but you might have picked up on the theme by now, so hopefully you'll know the one I'm going for, uh, Aladdin and Genie. A friend like me, yes. Good job, nailed it. (laughs) Um, Pastor Kyle mentioned last week that one of the biggest ways Disney infiltrates our lives is by getting their music stuck in our heads. And I wanted to help with that on that last slide uh, by transcribing Robin Williams' delivery as much as possible. Um, So you're welcome for that today. There are so many iconic songs that go along with the big character and relationship types that most people think of, I think, when they think of Disney. We have I Want songs in which our protagonists tell us what's driving them through the plot of the movie. Uh, Love songs, of course. Villain songs, always some of my favorites. But even though there are some really rich and meaningful friendships throughout the Disney canon, and they have, in my opinion, some of the best songs, they tend to rank somewhere below princesses and heroes and animal sidekicks. I think this is also true of the Gospels. Not the part about animal sidekicks, but the part about friendship not being the first thing you think of necessarily. We talk about a lot of what Jesus does during his earthly ministry, but we don't spend a lot of time acknowledging one of the most impressive things about his life. 
Y'all seen that? <laughs> I think that might be because we don't necessarily think of the disciples as Jesus' friends. Followers, definitely. Students, maybe. Um, often, we think of the disciples primarily as ways for us to learn lessons from Jesus. They ask questions, and then Jesus gets to answer, and then we benefit from those answers all these thousands of years later. And that is so important and wonderful. But we never get to see Jesus and the disciples just hang out. Uh, I went to school for creative writing before theology. I like school. And (laughs) I had a professor who used to make fun of me for my love of dinner scenes. Uh, These are like slow scenes where there's not a lot of plot happening. Uh, Characters just kind of talk to each other, and you get to find out what they're like and what their relationships are like and what they love. Uh, We do, of course, get to see Jesus and the disciples eat together, but I think it's fair to say those are very plot-heavy dinners, right? (laughs) Thank you. Um, And that's fair. So in The Fox and the Hound, uh, one of our song examples, the whole story, very sad story, is about the friendship between the fox and the hound. In the Gospels, there's a lot of important ground to cover, and there's only so much space to get everything in. Um, According to one count I found this week, there are just over 25,000 words in Luke and just over 23,000 words in Matthew. Those are the longest two Gospels. And for reference, um, people who decide to take on National Novel Writing Month, in which you write a draft of a novel during the month of November, which is nuts, (laughs) because the minimum word count to succeed at National Novel Writing Month is 50,000 words. So for economy of space, in the absence of dinner scenes in the Gospels, We have to work with what we know to get a picture of Jesus and the disciples as friends. So we know that Jesus did, of course, choose the disciples to learn from him, take those lessons, teach them to others. He needed people to carry on his mission and do the work and start the church. But if we take this story seriously and we believe these people were real, then we have to believe they were real people. They weren't just plot devices or hapless students, and their relationship with Jesus wasn't a casual one. As a quick poll, think real quick of 12 people you really like. Got them? Great. Would you want to spend all your time with them? All 100% of your time? What about three people you really love? Would you want to spend all your time walking around with them, never sure where you're going to stay or what you're going to eat, but pretty sure that you will all be disliked and or overwhelmed most of the places you go. This is not a life you could live with people you thought were just okay, right? Jesus has to like the disciples. More than that, part of Jesus being fully human for me is the idea that he loved his best friends. There is a Celtic concept of this deep friend love called Anamkara, I think. I watched a YouTube video for how to pronounce that. Anamkara literally translates to soul friend. Irish philosopher John O'Donohue writes about this in his book on Celtic wisdom. He says, with the Anamkara, you could share your innermost self, your mind, and your heart. This friendship was an act of recognition and belonging. You are joined in an ancient and eternal way with the friend of your soul. I know the concept of soulmates is a little cheesy and a little controversial, but I have to tell you, I believe we have soulmates, more than one, not exclusively romantic. In our scripture passage this morning, Jesus tells his friends that he loves them with the greatest possible love. I truly believe that one of the greatest gifts God gives us in this life is that every once in a while, we get to encounter an Anamkara, someone with whom we can share our innermost self, our minds, our hearts. I don't have to tell you that this life can be hard. (laughs) Our world is flawed. There's uncertainty and injustice and bigotry and tragedy, um, taxes, you know. (laughs) But also, there are soul friends. God put us here, and God gave us each other. That is magical. Anytime you get to know one of these people, you have ended up in the same place and time, and that's a miracle. And that's the kind of love that I think Jesus is talking about here in John. 
And even though we don't get a lot of story dedicated to Jesus and the disciples having friend time, uh, and from what we do get, by the way, we can say the disciples are not great friends to Jesus, (laughs) but Jesus himself does model good, deep soul friendship to us in ways that I think we can apply today. Uh, The first one comes from these verses, lay down your life for your friends. Immediate good news about this one, you will probably not literally have to do this. I, (laughs) I cannot rule out some kind of organ donation situation or something like that, but I can say with near certainty that you and I will never be asked to make the kind of sacrifice that Jesus makes. To revisit our Disney theme, there is actually a lot of life laying down for friends going on, and some of them are emotional. I guess all of them probably are emotional. Um, Here's a recent favorite of mine, uh, Wreck-It Ralph. Anyone? Yes, Randall loves Wreck-It Ralph. (laughs) Um, If if you haven't seen it, you should. This is like a last 10 years-ish, right, Um, addition to the Disney canon. It's beautiful and so sad. Every time I see this scene, I cry, even knowing that Ralph is going to be okay and they'll still get to be friends. And that is a tiny spoiler that the title hero of this Disney film doesn't die in this scene. So I'm sorry about that. (laughs) Because Disney owns everything, I get to name drop my favorite Disney prince, Tony Stark, (laughs) who makes or tries to make the ultimate sacrifice for his friends several times. Rest in peace, Tony. Um, To get back to our song game and actual Disney characters, Aladdin and Genie are a slightly less dramatic version of this. Only slightly. Genie sings that Aladdin has never had a friend like him, a magical blue one. But he also shares early in the movie that a lot of his friends had promised to free him and not followed through. At the end of the movie, spoilers again, I'm sorry, Aladdin, even though it means giving up being a prince and marrying Jasmine, breaks the cycle, and sets Genie free. So Genie has never had a friend like Aladdin either. I like that. That is not a literal life sacrifice, and in fact, Aladdin ends up getting everything he wished for anyway. But it's still a big deal. It's still bigger than anything you or I will likely be called upon to do for our closest friends. When I was a kid, that kind of bummed me out. (laughs) The idea that I would never get to make this kind of sacrifice for someone. I've always loved stories. I've always been a reader. I was a kid during the Disney Renaissance, so Aladdin and that whole era. Um, My favorite thing to do in my free time then and still, and I assume always, is just to consume stories. Some of you know how much TV I watch. (laughs) A lot. (laughs) A lot. Because I love a well-told story. I love high stakes. I love it when characters express their love for each other in intense situations that just don't really exist in day-to-day life. So it is good news that we won't have to meaningfully lay down our lives for our soul friends. But also, it's kind of a bummer. It just seems like it would be really cool. (laughs) What this looks like for us today is not very cool. It is not necessarily heroic. It doesn't have strong main character energy. This is how I've put it in the CCB, that's the Common Katie Bible. Greater love has no 21st century American soul friend than this, that they inconvenience themselves for their friends. I'm sort of joking, but I also don't think this is as easy as it sounds. Pastor Kyle has talked a few times lately about all the things competing for our attention, work, school, family obligations, church, I know it's not cool to say that you're busy and tired, but can we be honest with each other this morning? Are you not busy and tired? I am busy and tired. (laughs) This past year, I was working 40 hours a week, taking six credits of theology classes, doing a 10 hour per week internship as part of my theology program, and you might have noticed I'm also here a lot, and I love being here, and I'm lucky. I get to be here with a bunch of my soul friends, but even so, I was busy, and I was tired. Being asked to do anything extra felt crushing. Now it's summer, so I don't have some of that going on, but video games are really good right now, you know, so. (laughs) I didn't always make the right choice last year when I had the chance to make a small sacrifice for someone I love. 
and I usually knew when I wasn't making the right choice. And it's easy to do that because we also live in a culture that encourages a very particular sign, kind of self-care that's like, you should say no to things. And there's power in saying no. There is power in, I don't want to. And rest is crucial. We need so much more rest than we get. We are busy. We are tired. But I'm not talking about necessarily setting an alarm for 3 a.m. on a weekday every time that coworker who always gets your name like a little bit wrong wants a ride to the airport because they don't trust Uber and they don't want to deal with parking at RDU. Although I get that. I'm talking about showing up for your friends, your soul friends, when they need you. Jesus does this, not just at the crucifixion, Right after the feeding of the 5,000, Matthew chapter 14 tells us that Jesus sends the disciples ahead so he can take a beat at the end of what has to be an exhausting day. Right before the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus had spent the day healing crowds of sick people who followed him when he was just trying to spend some time away from crowds because he had just heard that his friend John the Baptist was killed. Evening came and he was alone. I don't know about you, but I can hear the sigh of relief. Like, finally. But then there's the storm. Jesus is up on a mountain, and his disciples are out on the lake, and they're afraid. Has anyone ever been more busy and tired than Jesus on a day he was mourning a friend, curing the sick, and then making sure 5,000 people had food to eat? Has anyone ever been more deserving of a minute to himself not even to nap or catch up on a show, but to pray, to pray. (laughs) It would be so easy to pretend he didn't see the SOS text. Sleep in just a little, get to it later. They will, of course, still need him later. But they need him now. The people Jesus has chosen, his best friends, need him. And he goes. Greater love has no one than this. We will probably not have an opportunity to die for a friend, but we will have these opportunities. Maybe a friend has a tough day at work and wants to talk to you about it, but you also had a tough day at work and you want to stay unplugged or keep reading the mystery novel that's just really getting good. And you can make that choice, and sometimes you need to. But sometimes we need to be willing to do the less convenient thing if we want to be the kind of friend that loves the way Jesus does. So that's all well and good. If you're Jesus, and you might point out that we are not, and we don't have the luxury of a writer's room crafting beautiful three-act narratives for us in which a clear choice arises between the right thing and the wrong thing, and the soundtrack lets us know this is our big moment. Maybe you're thinking you'd love to be an Anamkara, a soul friend, a love of Jesus friend, but you don't know how. There is more great news. You can practice. Friendship, like prayer and generosity and so much of what Jesus models for us, is a practice. Maybe it doesn't come naturally to you to remember birthdays, as an example. I bet you have a device that can remember that for you. Did any of y'all quit Facebook in the last few years? Anybody? Yeah, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Did any of you stay quit off Facebook? Hey, y'all are the real heroes. That's willpower. I quit Facebook a few times, and you can find me there after the service today if you want. (laughs) But one of the times I quit, I went through the birthday calendar first on Facebook uh, to put a bunch of my friends' birthdays in my phone calendar and added, like, alerts, because I want to be a friend who remembers birthdays. And I have to confess something to you. (laughs) This year, I have been friends with one of my soul friends for 20 years. She is one of the most important people in my life. Her birthday is 11 days before mine in the same year. I have been making fun of her for most of our lives for being much older than I am. I do have her birthday in my phone calendar, but I also have it in my brain. This year, I forgot. The notification came up, and I got rid of it because I was going to remember, and I didn't. (laughs) I texted her the next morning, with, like, sobbing emojis before the party face emojis to, you know, convey sadness. It's okay. We're okay. 
And actually, this week, that friend texted me to ask me to Google something for her because she was cooking and didn't have internet access. And I was in the middle of writing this sermon, but I paused and I Googled it. (laughs) Friendship is a practice, and I am still practicing, and I think we all are. Knowing what to practice can be hard. Uh, The golden rule could be helpful, right? If a friend does something that makes you feel seen and loved, make note of it and find ways to do that for them, for other people. I think even better, a variation on the golden rule. So instead of do unto others what you would have them do to you, uh, do unto others what they would have you do to them. But how do you know what that is? A little more great news. You can ask them. That's definitely what that says in the real movie. You don't need to look it up. It's not bad Photoshop. Maybe a soul friend is grieving a loss. I don't know anyone who is naturally great at responding to someone else's grief. It's heavy and personal and hard. Plus, just about everyone needs something different in those seasons, depending on who they are, who or what they've lost. But what they probably don't need from you is nothing. A few examples of questions to ask. um, Do you want to talk about them, say a parent who died, or do you want to talk about anything else? Uh, Because sometimes telling stories to honor their life is a relief and you just have been waiting for someone to ask. And other times you need to just stop thinking about them. I mean, think about anything else for just a minute. Do you need some time alone or do you want me to come over? Again, I think there is some shame attached here. I have felt before that I should just know. If I really loved this person, I would just know what to do. Especially if they seem to just know what I need when it's their turn, it's okay. Just ask. It's a little humiliating. Just ask. And if you don't know, now you know. Maybe this morning you've been trying to think of who your soul friends are and who might consider you one. Maybe you're wondering if those people are out there for you. I do not think there are many things that it's safe to promise from the pulpit, but Pastor Kyle isn't here, so I promise there is a soul friend for you in the world. Maybe you haven't met yours yet. Maybe you had one and you're not as close anymore, which happens. Seasons for everything, even some friendships. But I meant it when I said earlier that this no greater love friendship is one of the best gifts God gives us in this life. God wants this love for you, and God made you with love to share in a way that only you can, and God is not going to let your soul friends miss out on you either. A little further down in our scripture passage Julie read this morning, Jesus says this, I'm telling you this so that you can love each other. Okay, but where do you find them? I wish I had great advice for this. I can just tell you what worked for me. (laughs) I met a couple of my Anamkaras in 2007 on an online forum talking about Doctor Who. (laughs) The friend whose birthday I forgot, I met when we were both cheerleaders for a Christian school basketball team in eighth grade. Those were long skirts. One of my uh, best and most long-time soul friends I met in high school choir. You might recognize him. (laughs) We first bonded by burning each other mixed CDs of cool Christian rock, and I'm happy to explain both of those terms to you after the service if you need. (laughs) Assuming you can't necessarily do those exact things, The best advice I can give is to just stay open. Pay attention to what you love. Be open to people who love the same things in the same ways. And when you find them, there's nothing wrong with what my friend calls the first grade approach. Hi, you're great. I think we should be friends. I already mentioned I got lucky and met some soul friends here. And band, y'all can come back up. Um, Here, like here, like standing here. Thanks to a shared love of this faith and this place and of music. 
So maybe your soul friends are waiting for you to serve in a church ministry. <laughs> I, I didn't get paid to say that yet. <laughs> but every soul friendship in which you can share your deepest existential fears while eating snacks in sweatpants has to start with the mortifying ordeal of saying hello to a relative stranger. I do think Jesus also shows us how to recognize special encounters. In one of the post-resurrection stories, Jesus spends some time with two people who are traveling home from Jerusalem, and they don't recognize him. In fact, they spend most of the journey telling Jesus about his own death. So if you think that asking a friend for the third time when their birthday is is awkward, there's some perspective on like a really awkward conversation. Finally, they do recognize Jesus, and he disappears, and they say, weren't our hearts on fire when he was with us? Other translations say, didn't our hearts burn within us? They didn't realize they were with Jesus, but they knew that something special was happening. I mentioned earlier that there's only so much space in the Gospels for a whole lot of story, and I think that this story gets included at the end of Luke to teach us to pay attention when we feel our hearts burn within us, when we feel that special stirring, call it a heart on fire, call it the Holy Spirit moving, call it love. We don't get a swelling soundtrack under our big moments, but I do think we can learn to notice them. I think that's a practice, too. I know that I have felt this deep, heart-on-fire, no greater love with particular people in particular moments, certainly more times than I deserve. I hope you have, too. I promise you will. Thank you for listening to The Peak Podcast. Make sure you subscribe wherever podcasts can be found. For more information on how to get connected with our church, please visit us at thepeakchurch.org.